and welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. I'm Terry, the creator and co-host of this podcast. I've lived with depression most of my life, and I know how easy it can be to feel all alone in the experience. I'm not alone, and you aren't either. And I'm Dr. Anita Sands, a licensed clinical psychologist with a number of my own diagnoses, all of which bring a certain amount of anxiety and depression along with them. There is great power in shared experiences. We share our own as we engage in intimate and candid conversations with our weekly guests, exploring different perspectives on and experiences with depression. We keep it real because depression is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. This podcast is produced in partnership with Recovery.com. Recovery.com provides resources and information for individuals seeking treatment for mental health or addiction issues. Its website is a fact-checked and vetted online platform of treatment centers to help individuals find the right path to recovery. We release two new episodes a month, and the other weeks we will pull impactful stories from our archive of more than 400 episodes, stories that you may have missed if you're a newer listener. This episode is from the early years when Bridget, Terry's sister, was co-hosting. Hi, Bridget. It is so nice to have both of us back here again together. It really is. I love you, Terry. Thank you, Bridget. Since its inception, the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH, has recognized the importance of genetics in understanding mental disorders. Yet the findings of all its extensive research is that there is no simple relationship between genes and mental disorders. No gene has been found that causes depression, for example, or that explains how mental disorders affect one out of five Americans. Instead, researchers now believe that several susceptibility genes interact with each other and with environmental factors to influence the risk of developing a particular disorder. I think that's us, Terry. Yeah. As sisters with depression raised by a father with bipolar disorder, we're living proof of the shared findings in the fields of psychiatry, behavioral science, neuroscience, biology, and genetics that show the risk of developing an illness is increased if another family member is similarly affected. Today's guest, Matt Zinman, knows that reality firsthand as well. And he knows what many of you listening know without scientific study. Our mental illnesses or mental health disorders affect other people in our lives, and theirs can affect us and our mental health. Here is Matt giving his voice to depression. Well, it's great to be with you, Terry. Thank you so much for having me. You are more than welcome. Thanks for joining us. So I believe you wanted me to jump in and just share my story. Yes, please. That's what we do here. We figure the more we hear other people have experiences that are similar to, if not darn near the same as us, the more we realize that we're not alone. Well, we're definitely not alone. You know, for my part, uh, I grew up in a you know suburban middle class family, but with mental health being really a, a, a big part and influence of that childhood and experience, you know, for one, my dad was bipolar. And so, you know, there's a lot that goes with that and around the erratic behavior and anxiety of, you know, how he's going to be. And my mom was a depressive and a suicide survivor. A quick note, suicide survivor is a term that many use to mean someone in their lives, in this case, Matt's mother, survived an attempt to end their life. But you may also hear people say suicide survivor, referring to someone who lost a friend or family member by suicide. We are not correcting anyone, but we want to take a minute to say that we choose to say suicide attempt survivor or suicide loss survivor instead of suicide survivor. Because to us, it just seems a little bit clearer that way. So back to Matt's early and confusing exposure to mental disorders. As a young kid, I didn't understand it. You know, my mom might go through a phase and she was in bed. And I would be encouraging her, you know, like, come on, you know, I get out of bed. And she'd be, I can't. And I didn't understand. I said, well, 
what do you mean you can't? You know, your legs work. You, you, you put them on the floor. You know, you can make go to the bathroom. What do you mean you can't? Now, having been someone who also suffers from depression, I now understand that, but at the time I didn't. Matt was just 11 and a half when he came home from school to the chaotic scene of his father, paramedics, and his unconscious mother. Yeah, she didn't do it for attention. I mean, she was checking out. And I was very angry with her for quite some time. And she, you know, naturally was in a recovery facility. And um, I didn't understand why she would attempt that. So, you know, and... and Honestly, Terry, you know, we were talking pre-show and I've had different interviews along these lines. I've never spoken about this um, in prior conversations in terms of just that very phase where she was not with us. And thank goodness, you know, she she survived. But there was a disconnection that occurred as a result of that, you know, in my early teens. Matt says at the time he was also experiencing depression, though he says for a number of reasons. It would be years before he'd realize that's what it was. I was somewhat of a lonely kid, and I did experience those downs. And it wasn't until my early 20s when I had my first episode where I just was not functional. Uh, and in my experience, and at that time, you know, Prozac was fairly new, um, which sounds odd to say, right? I'm in my mid-50s now. And... And I would go on it and I would feel better and get more energy. And then I would go off of it because I didn't want to be on medication. And we'd be like, you know, just almost like turning a dial. And that happened over a period of years, several times where I'd go on and off, on and off. And, uh, and, you know, just trying to learn how to manage it. Then in 2012, tragedy struck his family again. I lost my brother, Dave. We lost him. Um, and he um, had a number of things going on. He had a work injury that led to the use of opioids and that crisis going on at that time. So he was out of work and displaced and, uh, you know, those various environmental factors that he was struggling with and in his family. He's got, you know, three kids. Um and, you know, they were fairly young at the time and, uh, you know, he didn't make it. And even to this day, I'm still, you know, it it reminds me of kind of how I felt with relation to my mom. Um, I'm, I'm still mad at him. I'm mad at him for him. You know, what he's missing out on with his kids growing up and, you know, just kind of like what an idiot, you know, like he should have known better. But at the same time in having to contend live with depression myself, I know that pain. I've gone through, you know, the suicidal ideation. I, I got at one point was in trouble with a medication change I had and was overpowered nearly by the side effect of suicidal ideation um, and had to switch out. That's the both and concept that comes up a lot in our conversations. You can, for example, have experienced depression before and still not recognize it when it returns. You can be not especially close to someone and still be deeply impacted by their death. You can understand suicidal ideation firsthand and still be really mad at someone for ending or attempting to end their life. I want to go back, if you're willing to, to your mother, and you just sort of referred back to it when you spoke of your brother, when you said that there was a disconnect after her attempt. Were you angry with her for attempting, and that's, was it like punitive almost to disconnect from her, or was it protecting yourself with the thought that if she might leave, you didn't want to be as close to her? Or was it neither of those? I, I, I'm i wondering. It's a, it's a fair question, honestly. I haven't thought about it in so many years. Um, and as I said, this is the first time I'm really speaking to it uh, in in this way. I think... Part of it was that I was following my dad's lead in that regard at that age. He was angry with her about it. And so maybe some of that behavior was modeled after him. I mean, I was I was a kid. Uh, and certainly legitimately, I had those feelings. Why would my mom leave me? I don't think of it as being 
punitive. It was just how I felt. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there was a process of healing that had to occur. And, and thank goodness, right? Because the thing with suicide for a lot of people, um, not, you know, my brother notwithstanding, is you don't get that closure. And at least, you know, with her, we were able to get the relationship on track. But I'm sure that uh, certainly not only in and into itself that it had a major effect on me, but I lost a certain part of my mom. And quite honestly, she was never the same. When talking about his brother's death a minute ago, Matt mentioned that he was once, quote, overpowered nearly by the side effect of suicidal ideation during a med change. Since that's a common enough experience that they routinely put warning labels about it on prescription bottles, we wanted to hear a bit more about his experience. Hmm. Yeah. I I mean, I, uh, in 93, I had to be hospitalized, um, which is something else I, I, I haven't spoken about, but I'm fine with it. Uh, because what I've learned I'm in the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area, so I can't claim to say this is the same as it is everywhere. Uh, but there's certainly any number of gaps in the mental health care system. I don't think anybody needs to be convinced of that. And in this area, there's really no in-between. If you're having a medication issue and you need it to be monitored closely, you can't get appointments fast enough and frequently enough in order to be properly monitored. And so being inpatient is necessary. And and you have to, even if you're not suicidal, which is a lot of reasons why you want to go inpatient if you can't keep yourself safe. Obviously, it's the other part of it. But for medication purposes, you've got somebody right there who this is what they do day in and day out with so many, you know, constantly. um, And they can kind of take a medication and turn the dial this way and that way uh, in terms of dosage or, you know, switch you out. That's just not possible otherwise. And I was talking to somebody about this recently, and they made me aware that there are these in between, you know, intensive outpatient facilities. But, you know, that was, I'm doing the math, 28 years ago. Um, that was not the case then. And I think for the most part, still not now. And in times that critical care is not required, but some support and understanding are, Matt reminds, we all need to be clear about where we will. And where we won't find that. In terms of, you know, allowing people to help me and and whatnot. Um, You know, for one, uh, you know, my parents are long gone. My other brother and sister, you know, they have their own lives. I mean, we're, you know, we're reasonably close. We stay in touch and we see each other now and again. But it's not like I would call on them. But I do have part of my safety net, a number of people who certainly know that I contend with depression and that I know even if it's not this overt, hey, I need your help, there are the people in my life who I know lift me up. People in life who lift him up. We really like that phrase. It is so easy to focus on and get discouraged by thinking about the many who just don't understand or step up. But maybe... If we center on the key few who lift us up, we'll feel better supported. I don't know, just a thought. There's so much to unpack there. Matt, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for validating and um, acknowledging the fact that we can be angry and mad and upset at somebody and probably feel guilty about that, but also love them. And I mean, just the the, the concoction of, of seemingly opposing emotions that can coexist. Um, I think we all just need to be reminded that things are not black and white and that we can feel and openly acknowledge, as you just did, the complexity of everything that can happen at one moment within us. And Bridget, can I refer back to your episode and your experience that you also in changing meds um, had a rough time? Absolutely. And that it was completely unexpected. And I did read some of, obviously, the fine print is so long, I did not read it all. But I was aware that there was um, a warning for teens 
for suicidal ideation. And that was certainly not my case. I believe I was in my early 50s at the time. And uh, it took me to say by surprise isn't even the right word, Terry, because I didn't acknowledge that it was, I had had absolutely no connection to the fact that it was coming, that there was this big shift that suddenly I felt way, way, way worse than I had even when I was going in to request the meds in the first place. And um, I, it just felt like me, it felt real, it felt true, it felt all encompassing. And in fact, it was the medication, but none of my care support system nor myself were able to connect those dots. So I'm there with you, Matt, it's intense and dangerous. And dangerous. When you say it felt real and true, you mean the thoughts that... Let me, let me caveat this conversation by saying I had no plan. I had done no research. I wasn't actually intending to, but there was on a cellular level, every, every mean, harsh, bullying word that my psyche was just cascading over me and steeping me with was negative and was self-destructive. That's what I mean. Now I have to thank you both for sharing your experience because I know people listening uh, who have had a similar experience or, or are concerned with or have been concerned with somebody who had it um, will hopefully better understand it now. Um, this is the first of two parts we're doing with Matt, and the, the main reason we reached out to him was because from his experiences, uh, many experiences, he has developed... Uh, some tools that I think are fabulous for managing our mental health. And we always talk about tools in our mental health toolbox. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. And uh, one in particular is called the three-day rule. And when I heard it, I was like, hey, we need to have you on the podcast. So uh, we encourage you to tune back in next week. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Bridget. And remember the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook community. We invite you to it. And if you have any comments about this episode, any other or suggestions for future ones, to go to givingvoicetodepression.com and look for that record widget in the upper left corner and leave us a message because it's really nice to have this not be a one-way uh, communication and to hear back from you. So thank you. And I'd like to close with saying, remember not to believe everything that your brain is telling you. Talk back. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate and reflect on your own experience with depression, or better understand how to support someone else who is struggling. If this episode has been of comfort or value to you, know that there are hundreds of others like it in our archive, which you can easily find at our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up, even if it's hard. If someone else is struggling, take the time to listen.